Hello everybody, glad you could join me for another lesson today. We're going to continue with our uh, discussions and, and learning activities with lateral earth pressures. In the first lesson, we talked a little bit about lateral earth pressure theory in general. We reviewed passive, at rest, and active lateral earth pressure cases. We introduced you to the idea of ranking lateral earth pressures, uh, particularly related to cohesionless soils. <clears throat> Excuse me. And now in this lesson, we're going to look at um, cohesive soils. We're also going to look at theories of uh, that we could apply where we consider friction between the soil and the wall, which the rain keen method does not consider. So uh, again, looking at the rain keen method, but this time for cohesive soils. So these would be soils like clays that have cohesion. If we have clay in the backfill, it presents some unique challenges. Um, we still are going to compute the lateral earth pressure like we did before. So uh, this H here, this is the height of our wall. And here's our active earth pressure coefficient from the Rankine method. And then it's just the unit weight times the height of the wall. And so once we get that pressure, uh, that would be the like the same lateral earth pressure we'd expect from a cohesionless soil behind the wall. But the problem, or as I say, that the unique challenge with cohesive soils is that we have cohesion. And if we're adding the effect of cohesion into the mix, um, or if we're trying to account for it, then it it essentially acts in a manner that tries to hold the soil up by itself. Cohesion does not want the soil to tip over. So as such, we are going to subtract the cohesion component from our lateral earth pressures. And the cohesion component we assume to be a uniform load on the wall equal to two times the cohesion times the square root of our active earth pressure coefficient. Now if we do the math, what we end up seeing is that there is actually a zone up near the top of the wall where the soil is trying to hold the wall up with cohesion or it's like it's stickiness. And so we call that the tension zone. So this is a zone where the wall and the soil are trying to pull away from each other as opposed to down here below where the soil is trying to push the wall over. So in this zone of tension, there's a couple things that could potentially happen. Uh, theoretically, the wall would help, or I should say the soil would help keep the wall standing. But that's not what happens in, in the real world. What usually ends up happening is a separation occurs between the soil and the wall, and then we get, end up getting a big gap behind the wall. And, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but uh, we, we can derive using the rain keen theory the depth of that tension zone or the depth in which a crack might develop behind the wall, and that's equal to this uh, equation right here where we call z naught that depth. In terms of which strength parameters do we use? Well, if we want to assume that the clay is going to behave in a drained manner when we shear it, then we would use drain shear strength parameters, C prime and phi prime. And when we plug those in, uh, we just use these equations down here. So they're like sands. The only difference is we have this cohesion component that we have to account for. If we want to assume that the soil will behave in an undrained manner, then we may say, okay, let's assume that the friction angle is zero, and we're going to assume that all shear strength comes from the undrained shear strength of the soil. So if we plug in zero for phi, that makes our active earth pressure coefficient equal to one. And if it's equal to one, then this simplifies this equation substantially so that we just get that equation right there. So the real behavior of 
a clay backfill will be something between a drained and an undrained case. So most engineers will just consider both cases, make sure that the wall performs okay for both, and then um, it should cover everything in between. So let's get back to this idea of the tension crack. Now if a tension crack forms behind the wall, a couple of things could potentially happen. Let's draw a little sketch here. So I don't like that color. Let's use black. And let's make my line a little thinner. So let's say this is the ground surface. And let's say that we have a retaining wall that's holding back this clay backfill. So a couple of things could happen here, OK? Uh, first of all, because this wall is trying to rotate over, because the soil is pushing on it, that's eventually going to form this crack behind the wall. That's the tension crack that we're talking about. Now, a few things could potentially happen. Uh, first of all, if that crack were to ever fill up with, say, water, like this, well, then that could be bad because that means that not only do we have the lateral earth pressure down here to deal with, but we also have the hydrostatic pressure from the water that we have to deal with acting on our wall. And that could cause a lot of loading or movement on our wall. And, and you know, you may say, well, it's just a little crack. How can a little bit of water cause that to happen? It really can, especially when grandma's up here, you know, uh, watering her lawn all the time. And, and those cracks can fill up with uh, water very, very quickly. So I would say if, if people are asking me why clay backfill is a, is a bad idea, uh, the first thing I would say is, uh, first of all, the tension crack can fill with water. There are some other reasons, though. Um, second of all, we know that in, in computing the stress behind the wall, typically we want to use a, um, a moist unit weight. But clay, because it holds more water, the moist unit weight is a lot higher than the moist unit weight of other soils. And so we, we never want water behind the retaining wall. If we get water behind the retaining wall, it's a really bad idea. It just adds more load to the wall than the wall typically can handle. So I would say that the second reason is that um, clays do not drain quickly and they can retain their moisture for a long time. And because of that, they just add extra load to the wall. Now this third one, uh, and the final reason I'll introduce to you, is kind of an interesting one. Now, you have to remember that we typically design these retaining walls to rotate slightly. And because they rotate slightly, they develop the active case in the soil. And that means then that all of this soil over here on the right that I'm highlighting and shading, all of this zone over here is held up by itself. The soil holds itself up with its own shear strength, which means that the wall only needs to hold up this little wedge of soil. So it's kind of a, a clever, ingenious thing that engineers do to reduce the demand that's on the wall. OK, so the wall rotates. The clay develops this failure plane and the walls happily holding up this little wedge of soil. But we learned uh, in an earlier lesson that clays are thixotropic. Thixotropic means that the clays heal themselves. And so the clays do not retain these shear planes for long. Um, and eventually, the clay will go back to trying to support uh, or, or, or basically the whole load of the clay is now pushing on the wall. So if that's the case, then the wall needs to rotate a little bit more and then the failure plane develops. But then the failure plane heals again because the wall, the clay is thixotropic, which then causes the wall to rotate a little bit more and then the plane develops. And so you have this 
back and forth, back and forth between active loading and then at rest loading and then back to active and then back to at rest and around and around we go. And the whole time what's happening to our wall is it's gradually tipping over. And so uh, I would say that clays cannot retain the active condition due to thixotropy. We won't talk more about thixotropy uh, in this class, but I mean there are entire books written on it, whole uh, researchers who devote all of their, their time and effort to it, so it's an interesting topic. Anyway, what we typically do as engineers is we are going to neglect this entire zone up here. We're just going to pretend it doesn't exist and we're only going to analyze this load down here, um, pushing the, the soil over or the wall over. And so we want to compute the equivalent force from that load and we can compute it using these equations over here on the right. So what about passive pressure? Well, it's, it's the same idea if we're using ranking theory, but instead of subtracting the cohesion, we add the cohesion. So it's the exact same thing. The only difference is that we now have an addition. Whoop, let me go back. We now have an addition sign instead of a subtraction sign. Okay. So you might ask yourself the question, how good is this ranking theory? This ranking lateral earth pressure theory assumes that there is no friction between the wall and the soil and that the only friction occurs along the failure plane in the soil itself. We know that's not true. We know that there is definitely going to be friction between the wall and the soil and that can impact not only the magnitude, but the, the orientation of that force vector. So how, um, how does that assumption affect uh, our designs? Well, a lot of researchers have looked at this question, and, and if, we, if we look at some free body diagrams of both the wall and the soil, we can see kind of what happens. So these researchers have shown that if we look at the active condition, we typically the real force acting on the soil and the wall was going to be oriented at some angle delta. And, and delta is the friction angle between the wall and the soil. And typically, you know, so the Rankine method is going to assume a linear failure surface that looks like that. But what we have observed uh, through experimentation and observation is that the actual failure surface looks something like this. So there is a little curvy portion down here, but for the rest of the, the way, it, it is pretty linear, just like the Rankine theory would predict. And so, you know, the final conclusion is that for the active case, the assumption of no friction between the wall and the soil isn't really a bad assumption. It's, it's, we don't lose too much from that. But for the passive case, again, here's what Rankine assumes happens, but when we measure it, that's what actually happens. So, for again, for the active case, it's not too different, but for the passive case, it's very, very different. So, you know, the moral of this story and what we learned from research is that wall friction does not affect the active case very much, but it has a huge impact on the passive case. So we may want to consider this wall friction or the friction between the wall and the soil, uh, particularly for the passive case. And if we want to do that, there, there's two methods. There's what we call the Coulomb method. Uh, which also assumes a linear failure plane, like the Rankine method. 
And there's another method called the log spiral method. And we're not going to discuss the log spiral method in this class. It's a little more complex, but in uh, later graduate level classes here at, at Brigham Young University, we do mention and, and teach about the log spiral method. It is a good method. But let's introduce the Coulomb method. So Coulomb method was actually developed in 1776 prior to the Rankine method. Coulomb was a French engineer and a really smart individual, and he, he decided, okay, let's draw a free body diagram of this soil failure wedge behind the wall. And let's go ahead and draw all of the forces that are acting on it. There's going to be a force from the retaining wall. There's going to be the weight of the, of the soil itself. I'm not sure why my pens always draw those horizontal lines. And then there's going to be friction between the soil, and that friction is going to act at an angle of phi, or the friction angle. And so, um, according to statics, we know that if we take these three forces, everything has to equal zero. The sum of the forces have to equal zero, which means if we were to draw those forces in a polygon, the polygon would have to close. So if we know or can compute what our friction force is, and if we know or can estimate what the weight of the soil wedge is, and if we assume an angle of friction between the wall and the soil, then we can back calculate what that force is between the wall and the soil. And if we do that for a variety of assumed failure planes behind the wall, what we can draw is kind of like a curve. Uh, and what we find is that the failure plane that corresponds to the maximum force predicted is the correct one. So um, engineers and mathematicians later said, hey, we can use calculus to just solve this solution correctly because all it is is a maximization or an optimization problem. So by taking the derivative of that function, we end up with this function right here, which is basically, uh, we're, because we're talking about the active condition, this is the um, active lateral earth pressure coefficient. All of these angles in this equation come from the geometry of the problem. So beta is the angle of our failure plane from the horizontal. Um, theta is the uh, angle of the retaining wall itself. And alpha is the angle of the back slope. So if we simplify it, we get the same equation that we're used to. And uh, again, here is a simplified form of that active earth pressure coefficient. What about passive pressures? Well, with Coulomb, we can do the same thing. And again, solve our polygon for the passive pressure acting on between the soil and the wall. And we end up with this equation right here. It's similar to the active, but you're going to see that some of these uh, signs, for instance, in the equation are different. Okay, but wait a minute. Coulomb assumes a linear failure surface. And as we observed uh, in the previous slide, passive failure is very nonlinear. So what that results in is a huge overprediction of passive pressures from the Coulomb method. And as a result, um, m most engineers do not use the Coulomb method for computing passive pressures. The only time they'll do it, that they'll get a reasonable answer, is if your friction angle between your wall and your soil is less than about half of the friction angle of the soil. But when does that happen? I mean, uh, so if I have friction angles between soil and smooth concrete, it might be three quarters of the friction angle. Or if I have a friction angle between soil and steel, that one might approach one half. But, you know, that's like polished steel. It's not like rough or, or, or you know, uh, rusty steel. So 
generally, just my advice is stay away from the Coulomb method with passive pressures. Uh, use the Rankine or use the log spiral method. Uh, one thing then, though that is nice about graphical procedures like the Coulomb, is that we can analyze really complicated geometries. So using those equations like I showed in the slides before only apply to very simplistic geometries of a retaining wall and a slope behind the wall. But what if you have something that looks like this, where you might have multiple terraces or multiple steps, you might even have um, a big load uh, and induced stress on top of your retaining wall. If that's the case, then you can use the Coleman graphical procedure to, uh, which uses the Coulomb active pressures to uh, estimate, I guess, the, um, the pressures on the retaining wall. Now, we're not going to cover this procedure in detail, but it is described in section 13.11 of your DOS book, and it's a handy thing to have in your back pocket if you ever need to use it. Okay, I want to close out with just a couple of things uh, regarding lateral earth pressure analysis in the real world. Um, and, and these are a couple of points that I pulled from my personal practice as a consulting engineer. So a lot of this stuff may not be in the literature, but it's what engineers do in the real world. So I want to share that with you. Um, first of all, we generally recognize that the Rankine method is going to give us a conservative estimate of lateral earth pressures, which means that it's going to predict large active pressures and it's going to predict lower than uh, actual passive pressures. So a lot of engineers like it because it's giving them conservative estimates. It's very simple and easy to use. The problems, however, come if because of that conservatism you're spending a lot of extra money to beef up your retaining wall when you may not need to. And if that's the case, and if that's affecting you, then you may want to use a different method. So what method do we use? That brings us to uh, bullet point number two. A lot of engineers will use the Coulomb method for the active case because it gives them very good, very accurate estimates of the active pressures. But then they'll use Rankine method for passive case because they feel that's uh, somewhat conservative. Now, few, if any, engineers are going to use the Coulomb method for the passive case. Just follow my advice and stay away from it. If you want to consider friction on the wall, then go ahead and use like a nonlinear method like the log spiral method. You can find that in most soil mechanics textbooks or just take a graduate class here uh, at BYU and we'll discuss the uh, log spiral method in those classes like 641 or 644. I do want to um, discuss a little bit about seismic lateral earth pressures. I mean, I am an earthquake expert. That's what I do for my research. Seismic lateral earth pressures are a big deal, but they are a lot more complex than these static lateral earth pressures. Uh, because of that, these methods are pretty abused, I'd say, in practice. Um, and you'll see practices that range all like, from all crazy stuff that people do. And so it's important that we learn how to do these seismic lateral earth pressures correctly, uh, especially given some new research, or relatively new research, probably within the last 10 years that has come out of the uh, University of California at Berkeley from uh, Professor Nick Sitar. He's done some great stuff with he and his students. Um, and so we will cover those things and learn about them in my 545 earthquake class, which I also have lectures on, um, though not complete at this time, um, on this YouTube channel. The last thing I want to keep in mind is that all of the walls and things that we draw in these um, examples, like this wall right here, for instance, they show like a big gravity wall, right? It's some big bulky thing that's uh, using its mass to try to prevent the soil from tipping over. The reality is very few people use those types of retaining walls today. In fact, what more engineers use is uh, what are called mechanically stabilized earth or MSE walls. 
And you see these walls all over the place in the United States, and, and it's because they're so functional, they're very reliable, and honestly, look at these panels that are holding up um, the facing of the wall here. They're probably no more than uh, 10 or 12 inches thick, and that's all the way up. So they're, they're relatively very, very thin. How these walls work is that uh, engineers will go ahead and lay down their drain system, and then they'll start applying soil in lifts and compacting it. Soil, soil, soil. And then when they get to a certain height, they lay down a grid of reinforcement. That reinforcement could be like steel grid like that. It could be like a geo grid, like a polyethylene or a plastic. It could be metal strips or whatever it is. But the point is that these strips are trying to add tensile strength to the soil. Then after that, uh, on top of that, they'll start compacting and, and laying down more soil, more soil, more soil, and then they'll put down another grid. And so they follow this pattern all the way up the wall, like you see in this picture right here. And those grids will actually provide tens or tensile strength to the soil. So then when you see a wall like this, these, these panels that you see on the wall are really doing very little work. All they're doing is, is keeping the soil from unraveling. What's holding that wall up and keeping it vertical are these, um, these reinforcement strips in the soil and the soil itself. So um, we'll discuss a little bit more how to design these systems in our 644 class. So uh, that's all I have for this lesson. I appreciate your attention. In the next lesson, we're going to introduce you to the topic of bearing capacity. Can't wait to see you then. Thank you and have a great day.